So, uh, Giselle, I'd like to begin with you. Horizon 2020 is coming, and under Framework 7, there have been numerous programs that DG Connect has been moving forward, particularly in e-health, health systems, health systems analysis, AIDS treatment, et cetera. Can you give us a general idea of where you are now in that process with Framework 7 and how you see this moving forward under Horizon 2020, particularly relating it to sort of data sharing, data protection, interoperability, things that are very germane to the discussion earlier? Okay, yes. Um, in FP7, we were mainly dealing with simulation and modeling, so the virtual physiological human. This was one of the pillars we, are, we are dealing with. And the other part was the personalized health systems. Um, these two items will be continued on the Horizon 2020. And in the meantime, uh, our policy activities have a bit shifted. Uh, means we are still promoting e-health. We have been looking what are the barriers, what is the potential, what should be done to promote on a wider scale e-health. But uh, we are now also focuses, focusing on mHealth. So uh, we see that a lot of apps are coming up, um, are becoming available for the citizens. And uh, we think we need there uh, some type of um, kind of uh, creating a framework where citizens can build up trust in those apps. We see that anybody can develop an app and put it in an app store and it's dealing with uh, applications which are uh, affecting your health, the health of the, of the citizen. Um, we don't know what uh, is happening with the data. It also creates a lot of data which would be a source for research, an interesting source for research. Um, it should be integrated or could be integrated with uh, uh, electronic health records. So it would be uh, for benefit of the citizen to know more about this, uh, the benefit of the health professional by having more data uh, about the patient, he can make uh, more uh, justified decisions. Uh, we also see the potential um, regarding uh, the industry, the, the growth, uh, creating of jobs by, by uh, promoting mHealth, and of course the benefit for the healthcare systems. So by um, giving the patient more uh, empowerment in, in um, controlling his health and disease management, uh, we can lower the cost of the healthcare system. So also the public authorities are interested in uh, promoting uh, mHealth, telemedicine, and in general eHealth. Well, when I, when I hear apps, I mean, first off, it's very exciting, but I also see a legislative nightmare how are you going to regulate interoperability, quality? How are you going to deal with those aspects? I mean, you're going to capture all this data, but how are you going to make it transferable? I mean, there's got to be a lot of back processes and regulatory procedures in place in order to make that usable. Well, there are different categories of apps. So the, the category where it's clear are the apps which uh, are including a medical act. So they are regulated by the medical devices uh, directive. Mm -hmm. Um, our concerns are uh, for the other apps, which are a bit in the limbo. Um, well, there is a lot of legislation, but it's not clear which legislation applies. Mm -hmm. Is it the uh, radio and uh, telecommunication terminal equipment? Or is it uh, the general safe, uh, product safety? Is it consumer protection? While this, uh, we are a bit uh, elaborating on this, we are preparing a paper to uh, point out what is the current situation and in fact to come then to, with the question to the constituency, what is your view that what Europe should do to enhance or stimulate the use of mHealth and empowerment of the patient? Now, now leading on from that, your, your Green Paper Action Plan from January 13th said two key, two real key planks to this debate. One is to address issues currently impeding in e-health interoperability so again, that interoperability, and then to improve the legal certainty for e-health. And again, that sort of goes into my question. I hate to drill onto this, but how are you going to deliver on that? I mean, what do you see as the possibility under Horizon 2020, I guess? What sort of exact programs or what are you looking at? Well, within Horizon 2020, we do not address the, the legal issues. So mm -hmm. this is a policy work. 
Uh, we are preparing this green paper and we will come this, um, with this green paper to the constituency to, to get their view and to get their uh, opinions on what needs to be done. Where we have the technical issues, how to integrate um, data created by the apps, how to integrate it uh, with the electronic health records to make it interoperable. Um, this is something which will be addressed in Horizon 2020 how it can be used for personalized health systems uh, where really the empowerment of the patient is in, in the first place. Okay. Thank you. Does any, anybody have any questions for Giselle while, before I move on? Anything? You're very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, John, I want to go to you next. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I hear in the discussions of big data there are no examples of big data working. There's no examples of actual healthcare data and healthcare metrics delivering value from the IT, ICT space. Now, what's intriguing is that with your Watson platform that you're rolling out, primarily that I'm aware of with WellPoint in the United States, there's increasing, there's r numbers coming out that it's actually very favorable and you are controlling patient data. You're dealing with it in a secure space, which obviously, as you heard earlier, is one of the key issues. Can you just get into a little bit what IBM is currently doing in the healthcare space with big data and the Watson platform and, and some of the work you've done with the commission before and, and how are you going to go forward? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Duane. So um, this question about big, big data for healthcare, uh, we, we all understand that uh, um, it's essential to use data for a number of, of benefits. Uh, one is this whole question of improving uh, medical science whether it comes from clinical trials or understanding real-world data. Um, and we can use that to affect population health and personal, personalized medicine. We can improve treatment for individuals. We can also use data, of course, to um, uh, recognizing the, you know, the, the social determinants of healthcare. We can use data mm -hmm. in order to understand how interventions might be put in play at the social level um, to, to help people avoid health risks. And then further down the road, we can use it to reconfigure our healthcare systems so they're more efficient. So IBM is involved in quite a few projects now um, around the world, which are really to do with um, this, this notion that we've got, the, we've got the storage capacity and the computing capabilities and the connectivity now to do much more than we could even five years ago. Um, and this is due to the fantastic progress we've seen in information technology, uh, Moore's Law, giving us a huge Im Im price performance improvements in processing. Crider's Law, which is the same kind of thing applied to storage, means that we can now, for $600, buy a disc that will hold all of the world's recorded music. Um, we've got six billion uh, phones um, in, in the world. We, we've got 10, 10 billion things connected to the internet other than humans, and that will keep on increasing. So we've got this huge pool of data that we can work with. Um, what can we do then to, to, to derive more value from the data itself? Well, I think we're moving into an era now where it's no longer just a question of tabulating data and trying to basically assemble it so that we can, as humans, um, interpret it. Um, that will still continue, but we're now on the threshold of using computing power to actually make the decisions with us, not necessarily instead of us, but with us, um, to give us more options. So two projects I'll just touch on very briefly. One is uh, one that was sponsored by the European Commission called EU Resist. Uh, some of you may know about it or even have been involved in it. It was really to do with um, HIV treatment. And the idea that if you're treating HIV patients, um, you have a huge number of options to choose from in terms of the cocktail of drugs that you're going to use. Um, so the problem here is one of, of complexity and the inability of the human mind to hold all these variables in, you know, in one place to make a rational decision based on that. So we basically developed a, uh, a, an engine um, for the EU Resist project, which allowed us to look at huge numbers of, of, uh, of uh, components of data to help us make better decisions. So this database we developed has 700,000 HIV uh, virus loads. So we're basically looking at the genome of the virus itself. It, we, it contains 60,000 previous cases of HIV treatment um, and 150,000 combinations of drugs that may be applied to help uh, deliver the outcome for the patient. When we developed this thing, we got it to the point where it was um, better than 
um, all but, but one of the 10 doctors, the 10 expert doctors that we pitted the system against. Um, this is an example of where you've got huge uncertainty about what's going to work best. And even, even the E-resistor engine doesn't get it right more than about 75% of the time. But that's still better than, than most of the experts uh, can do um, unassisted. So I think we're seeing the beginning of uh, this application of technology to look at vast data sets, to do the linking and the analysis, and to come back with, with the, best, uh, the best possible uh, or the optimum um, uh, choice. The second one is the Watson project, which uh, uh, Dwayne mentioned. Who's, who's seen Watson already on YouTube? Anybody? OK, if you haven't seen Watson, go and take a look at it. What is it? It's a supercomputer. We developed it as a kind of a dare to see if we could beat humans at general knowledge. So the idea of, of Watson originally was to put it on a live television show where we asked it lots of questions. And it had to be quicker and more accurate than the two reigning champion humans. And it won the contest. Uh, so, so what? We made some money. We gave it to charity. But the question then is, what can you do with a machine like Watson? Well, what is it? It <coughs> understands natural language. It can understand English and can interpret it. It can consume vast amounts of information and generate hypotheses from that information and then weigh evidence. And finally, it can learn. It's, it's, it has machine learning built into it. So we've now applied it to healthcare, and we're using it in two ways. One is in a company called WellPoint, who cover 36 million American lives. They are basically a healthcare insurance company. And they're using it for um, pre-authorizing treatment. So when the doc calls up WellPoint to say, I want to put my patient through this particular treatment regime, Watson can be used to assess whether that's the, the right thing for this patient. The manual process is to go to a nurse, and the nurse talks with the doctor, and the whole thing can take two or three days to get back with a yes or a no. With Watson, it can be done in about three seconds. Mm -hmm. And what's happening now is that nurses are using this 90% of the time. If Watson says, this is the right treatment for this patient, the nurse accepts that treatment. 10% they still have to go off and, and, and look again at the, uh, at, at the case. This is a fantastic improvement in speed and accuracy. The second area we're using it in finally is uh, oncology, where we're working with a, a major oncology center, Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the top cancer centers in the States based in New York. And what we're doing there is basically, again, looking at a particular class of cancer. It's, it's, it's non-small cell lung cancer. And we're seeing whether we can use Watson to basically make better uh, prognoses, better predictions about efficacy for treatment than the docs can. So we've trained it. We've given it about, about 15,000 hours of training. Um, we've presented it with 600,000 points of evidence, uh, 1,500 real case histories. And now we're using it to basically generate better um, options for the doctors to choose from when it comes to treating cancer. And now you're using actual patient data, patient yes. records that are in the system. Yes. And you're dealing with that confidentially, obviously. And, yes. and there's been no issues of data leakage or any problems Not so far. far. Nothing I've read about, about no. <laughs> well, aside from potentially the NSA. Um, then I can say that joke because of my accent. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure I'll get weird calls tonight. Um, now, getting back to the, um, the prognosis ability of Watson, one of the things about the WellPoint data, as it stands right now with a 90% confidence, it's performing at roughly 96%, whereas the human doctors were performing somewhere between 50 and 55% of the first diagnosis, diagnosis being accurate. Yeah, so, so one, of, one of the people we're working with in, in MSK, Dr. Chris, basically you can again go on YouTube to find his videos about this, but he says that a lot of the time, you know, the decision making that the doctor is, is engaged in is no, no better than the toss of a coin. It's a 50% or 60% probability of getting it right first time. So I think anything we can do to help the doctors to improve that first time decision making. I mean, eventually doctors will maybe get back round and after a few iterations get to the right answer. But I think what we're talking about here is using the technology to drive this mm -hmm. fundamental change in the way that doctors think about what their options are. Watson will not give you the you know, one answer. It always gives you a series of answers um, and the, uh, with a confidence level. And the idea of the doctor's uh, um, role here is to basically use that to augment or to even uh, generate some further insight by asking Watson more questions. Um, so that you end up with a better and faster result for the patient. Thank you. Any, any more questions for John before I move on? Anyone else? Yes, please. So is this based on simulation and modeling? So 
predicting what will happen if I do this treatment or the other one. Mm. So it's, 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 it is based on building a model <coughs> of, of what the treatment is like to, likely to result in, but you, you're basing it both on a deep knowledge of the patient based on the medical history, everything you know about them, but also a complete, a complete review of all the medical literature that's available to you. So as, as medical literature gets you know, more, um, uh, more diverse, as, as there's more of it, uh, we can start to use it to basically generate more insights. So the more evidence you, you put in front of Watson, the more it will generate uh, other hypotheses. But does it include the, the models, how a liver works, how the tissue reacts on, on some substances and so on? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't use it in that way. It's basically using knowledge generally contained in, in text. So it's, it's reading the material and then weighing the, the, the quality of the evidence. It, Watson does not understand the biological processes that are going on. So there's no kind of you know, model of the human body inside it. It's purely a, a question of weighing evidence and coming up with hopefully a better answer than the human mind could on its own. Any, any for, anything else for John? Yes, a question. <coughs> Very quickly. Is it on? <coughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Um, do you see in the future that Mr. or Mrs. Watson <laughs> could uh, somehow integrate a patient perspective, meaning that <coughs> it's reading and taking into consideration all of those documents and so on, but um, at the, for example, doctor's uh, surgery, then the doctor could, uh, while discussing with the patient, could put some things in there that come up with the discussion. Could Watson do that in the future? Well, there's, there's many use cases for Watson. We're, we're still assessing you know, which are the most valuable. But essentially, yes. I mean, think of this as being uh, the assistant. A lot of people call it Dr. Watson, even though we didn't christen it that. It kind of, you know, because Sherlock Holmes, who had a brilliant mind, had his Dr. Watson to keep him, keep him you know, um, grounded, as it were, in reality. So we can see lots of use cases at the point of care. At the moment, we're using it very much in these specialist areas, um, but as we develop it further and start to bring it to market, because it's still a research project today, even though we're using it for clinical work, um, uh, we, we can imagine using it in all kinds of other settings, in primary care setting, even the possibility of being able to consult directly with Watson as an individual patient. Anything else? Okay, thank, thank you, John. Now, Nicola, I'm gonna turn to you now because Obviously, what we're looking at is the value chain, and so we have the systems, we have the funding and the research side. Now we're getting to the practical research, the utilization of data to actually create new drugs and new therapies. Now, Welcome is a long history through the Sanger Institute and several other um, levels of work that you do and fund. And if people aren't familiar with uh, Welcome Trust, they're the second largest private funder of healthcare research in the world. Is that correct? Still? Good. Shares are up. And um, if you look in your pamphlet, there's a really wonderful article in an interview that was written by Nuala Moran and with, uh, with Nicola that outlines a lot of the work they're, they're doing. Can you give us sort of a thumbnail sketch of how you've handled your research data in the past and how you see yourselves working with industry and with researchers in the UK going forward? How do you see this playing out in the context of our discussion today? Yeah, cool. So uh, the trust links data sharing is essential across all research to maximise the value of the data that we funded the generation of it and we want to get maximum benefit out of it. Um, different disciplines and research communities are in slightly different places as to whether or not they agree with sort of the data sharing ethos or whether or not they need a bit of help and support to get there. So the community that I think has really led the way from in biomedical research is genomics. Um, starting with the Fort Lauderdale and Bermuda principles. And there, I think there really is a feeling that genomic data is a community resource and you need to get it out there and available to other researchers as quickly as possible. Um, some of the other sort of subject areas, public health, epidemiology studies, the researchers perhaps feel slightly more ownership of their data, particularly cohort studies, if they've spent many years building up their data set, they obviously want to have first access to it and get the benefits from it first, but we're encouraging them to think about ways other researchers could get the benefits of that work. Um, 
and I'll come back to how one does that in a minute. Um, a third element is getting better value from existing data sets like patient records in the NHS and trying to ensure that researchers can access electronic patient records and then new areas now are looking at how one can get better benefits from sharing imaging information and lastly and most relevant today clinical trials data but it's all about really opening up research data sets to maximize the opportunities to allow new research questions and I think there the idea of sort of really accessing large numbers of data and also linking different data sets and different types of data is where there's the most exciting opportunities potentially. Um, in relation to clinical trial data, um, I think here data sharing and transparency is particularly important for all the reasons that we heard about in the session before, not least the obligation to the <laughs> participants who took part in the trials and sort of gave their time and their data and took the risks on themselves. So I think there's a real obligation to the participants to make sure that we get this right for clinical trials, but also we need to assess interv interventions to verify results and there's a huge value of reuse of the data there. Um, we heard this morning the three separate elements of that transparency discussion. There's registration, there's the sort of reporting of the main summary findings and then there's the access to the underlying patient level data. I think those first two, the registration and the reporting, they're not perfect yet, but I think the mechanisms are in place that people know what they should be doing and how to do it, even if they're not actually doing it. I think it's a different question when one gets to the underlying patient level data. There aren't those mechanisms in place yet, and that's what we're very keen to see established. Um, and I think really because that's where the most exciting opportunities are, it's not just about the independent scrutiny of the data, it's about using the data in new ways to ask new research questions. But because it's personal level data, it's ident potentially identifiable, you've got to make sure that patient confidentiality is at the heart of any model that you use. And so it does need a controlled access model. And that comes back to the sort of learning that we can get from the genomics work the work at Sanger and the cohort studies, because there are already in place a whole number of different models of controlled data access committees. And all of them, and that there are a range of different approaches, but they will involve looking at who the researcher is, who what the question is, and what the initial consent was. Um, there's we've been sort of doing an analysis at the moment looking at more than 80 data access committees and there's a huge variety of different processes, different types of review panel, is it an independent panel, how closely linked is the PI in the decision making, what do they actually look like look at in the proposals, is it the researcher's status, are they accredited researchers or is the focus more on what the questions that are being looked at and then the next sort of level is how is the data accessed? What kind of process? Do, can the data just be sent by email? Do you have to access it through a set portal? Do you actually need to be in a secure environment? Is it a safe haven type approach? Right through to very secure access processes which the sort of Office of National Statistics and the Data Archive uses for some where a researcher actually has to physically go to the place to access the data. So there's a whole range of different models. There's also a range in how transparent those different models are. A lot of these data access committees which are about improving access and transparency, there's no information about them in the research website and that clearly isn't a model that one would want to suggest. Um, there's also an increasing move to consolidation of data access committees, so you don't have a new separate panel for every single research data set. Um, some of the genomic studies, the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, there's one access committee that looks at 
50 different data sets and sort of takes the decisions on those. Um, ALSPAC on the longitudinal cohort studies is now also managing the 1950s data set. Um, another model is the Biobank model where there's an ethics and governance committee, there's a very clear data access policy and it's sort of keeping it at independent arm's length from the biobank researchers. So there are a range of different models that I think we can look at in relation to clinical trials data. But I think one of the things that we need to think about is making sure you get the most value from the data and is the best way of doing that to follow the approach where each company sets up their own processes, separate review panel process, separate way of accessing the data, or do we need to move to a process and a model where you can link data from different companies and ask different questions because you're getting separate trials information all in the same place. Would, uh, would Welcome want to manage that process? Is that something you'd like to get into? I don't think we would want to manage the process itself. We would be happy to Act as help. an arbiter of taste? <laughs> <laughs> to help broker the formation of a consortium to get to that stage, not least because so far this morning we've really been discussing industry sure. trials and actually there's a lot of non-commercial academic trials and we need to join them all up together. We need to look beyond just CTIMPs and the whole range of clinical trials. And I think as soon as you start broadening those discussions, you possibly need a neutral broker to try and get sure. it all together. And what, I, what I've always liked about the Sanger Institute policies of the Wellcome <laughs> Trust is it's allowed for, you know, the data access is allowed for academics, it's allowed for industry, it's allowed basically for, for anybody who wants to use it for viable purposes. And I, I do want to, you have, you have a quote here from your article, and I want to get this right. It's, identified patient data should not be openly published. There should not be a free-for-all. And, and I think that's a really important principle that essentially is guiding a lot of the discussion, both in the first panel and this panel. It's, it's where does it become a free-for-all? Now, we all have a different opinion. I mean, I'm, 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 my free-for-alls are kind of wild, probably. Maybe others are less so. But I understand that that's sort of that inflection point as far as welcome's concerned, correct? Yeah, I think so. I think one can look at a <coughs> tiered level, um, a sort of tiered access model. So the more identifiable the data or the higher risks, then the greater the controls that you need. Mm -hmm. And for the fully aggregated, anonymized, absolutely no potential of re-identifying, then you don't need the same levels of control. And that's why a lot of the discussions about the putting CSRs in public domain, a lot of it isn't, there's no potential sure. of identifiability if you take out the sort of serious adverse events and things. So I think it's only when you get to potentially identifiable information, but also by adding an additional layer of controls, you can act, go further than the current FPA proposals potentially and have, if you get the right consents in, pro, in place going forward, you could actually open up access, controlled access to Across. fully identifiable yeah. information, which is potentially most useful for rare diseases, stratified medicines. You, you then sort of keep everything possible. A central, so you, you do become sort of a central arbiter, if not. A independent review panel sure. would need to be a uh, in place. arbiter, yeah. And so you've been having discussions, I know, with the government, yes? Yeah, we held an initial workshop a few months ago at the Trust with a wide range of stakeholders, including academics, industry, regulators and the government. We've sort of continued discussions with those partners. We're keen now to broaden those discussions, particularly to industry, both large pharma and small biotech. And the other part, which is really important, is making sure it's global. Sure. This can't just be UK or Europe. Trials are international and any consortium model any access model needs to be closed. So then the, the FDA proposal or that's out there that no data, that's, that's a problem for welcome. <coughs> yes, okay, <laughs> thank you. And any questions for Nicola? Everyone's writing frantically, yes. Do you have a name for that global initiative? Uh, the question is, does you have a name for that global initiative? And where are you from, ma'am? Sorry, there's a microphone. I'm from IMI. Thank you. Uh, no, not yet. At the moment, we're sorry. It's the microphone there. At the moment, we're in very early discussions as to whether there would be interest before we even say yes, go for a consortium. So, uh, if you want to put names on the table now, to please do. <laughs> we could have <laughs> a contest. Uh, we'll open up a raffle in the lobby at the break. People can put in their names. We'll 
choose. And also, if anyone would be interested in being involved in discussions about a potential consortium, do please let us know. Any other questions? For yes, right there. Uh, just wait, wait for the mic, please. Otherwise, we don't get you on the video. Thank you. I think if one <coughs> looks at the biobank model, as I say, data access committees, there's a huge range. Biobank is appointed, I think it's appointed by the EGC, so a separate ethics and governance council appoints it. I think one would need to look at what the governance arrangements are, and we don't have any details yet, and it's one of the things that would need to be agreed by all the members of the consortium. I mean, I, I think it would, the panel would need to be employed and appointed by a body, whether or not the consortium together is the group that does that, or whether or not you have a separate standalone institution that does it. I don't know. There are a lot of details that would need to be thought through. Yes, but in the same way that I mean, some of the panels now, I don't think you can tote by independent of the panel, not employed by them, but expert enough to understand what the issues are, which means in the past they might have received funding from a company, they might have been part of the company. Any other questions before we move on? Thank you. Okay, finally, last but not least, um, Bert Widler, you spent nearly 20, 20 plus years at Roche as the head of compliance. Yeah. Yes, and then you've moved on to greener pastures with your own firm. And this firm was recently contracted by the ABPI to develop their clinical trial data toolkit, which actually plays very well in the discussion today with what Nicholas is talking about, with what John and what Giselle is talking about. It's, it's looking at how industry can, another option for industry to use clinical trial data and pool it in a single source. How did you make, first off, how did you make this transition from working in compliance at Roche to moving to work in consulting to the ABPI? And how, you were the project leader for this tool. Tell us about what you, what it is, because it's only two weeks old, and what you hope to get out of it. Well, first of all, uh, when I listen to you uh, about Watson, then what I'm talking about is probably not even the moustache of Hercule Poirot. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, <coughs> it's something very simple, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's a contribution that shows how we should continue because it creates this sort of transparency about the how. Uh, what do, are we doing? How are we going to implement it? Being very transparent about uh, the processes, but also allowing uh, to fight, I think, what is a disease in the industry. And it's, I think it's all what uh, we also hear from this transparency piece is that we don't reinvent the wheel all the time, but that we share best practices. Uh, and by sharing, we learn from the weaknesses of this best practice, and then we can bring it to the next level of uh, of uh, excellence. Uh, why did I get this uh, this assignment? Uh, that I'm very very happy that I got it. Is uh, when I was head of uh, quality quality assurance in Rush, I was also responsible for the whole disclosure activity. And as a matter of fact, I was one of the co-author of the joint position paper that was uh, written uh, issued by IFPMA. And that's how I got into the disclosure space, and I kept my interest in the disclosure space. And the responsible at ABPI was a colleague of mine <laughs> in Roche. She knew that I had an interest and uh, some knowledge in the in this area, and that's how I got mm -hmm. how I got the assignment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it also fits quite nicely because the toolkit uh, is uh, about the process, is an SOP, is points to consider, is also lessons learned so that I used what we learned in implementing the disclosure practices in, uh, real, in real life uh, and to put that as points to consider for others who are going to implement the disclosure activity. And the goal of ABPI is really is to help uh, their members to have a starting point uh, when uh, implementing a bulletproof uh, disclosure process. It is true. Uh, it's, there is a law, uh, at least in the US. Uh, uh, compliance yeah, could be 
optimized, uh, uh, not discussing whether it's 30%, 60%, or 70%. And what I learned also uh, in discussing with other colleagues and companies is very often uh, many who are involved in uh, disclosure don't see that as a key, as a key deliverable. In the industry, Many companies still, they delegate that to the clinical teams and it becomes just another task. It's no wonder that then the compliance uh, is not stellar. And in academia, we, that, we did recently a survey through DIA, through the, uh, uh, the community, the disclosure community. Uh, we also involved academia. Many of the uh, researchers are not even aware that there are disclosure uh, obligations. Uh, this was mainly relates to uh, responses from the US, but they were totally unaware of the US legislation. They thought this is only this is something that <coughs> just needs to be done for uh, industry. It's nothing for them. And that's the intention. It's in a way, uh, go to this site. It's public. It's for free. You can download it. You can learn it. You can use it. Uh, it's a starting point. And I think that's the way we should, uh, we should uh, tackle the whole uh, disclosure issue, that there is better sharing. There are more standards. And I think what uh, you have proposed is a, is a great uh, way forward to take away some of also of the practical issues. I hear Ben very well when he says, yes, uh, we need to go back 20 years. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the devil is in the detail. It's not that easy to, uh, to be solved, especially if we talk about patient level data. If we talk about module one of the final study report, that's relatively easy. But not even that is so easy because many trials, especially if you go back 20 years, they never have seen a clinical study report. I mean, these are uh, some smaller studies, studies uh, conducted uh, sometimes by affiliates of large multinational companies, and the only thing that they have produced is a publication. And uh, I agree, it's information that's out there. I think it's valuable information. We need to find a way how we can leverage it. but. Uh, uh, we need to find also practical ways how we can tackle this. And that's, uh, uh, to come back to your, uh, to your question, that's what ABPI wanted to make a small contribution. It's not as ambitious, but at least it's doable and it can be done relatively quickly. But what's, what's intriguing to me is not only has ABPI done that, but Roche, you were the head of the team at Roche that put in their compliance and sharing system. I think a lot of people aren't aware that Roche has already been doing this for how long. I mean. So you were in charge of that. How did that system go in, and what was the reaction to that, both internally and externally? Well, when when the whole debate started back in 2005, uh, more or less, then uh, we immediately realized that there was a need to do something proactively. You could not simply wait that things are changing. And that's why uh, the decision was made by the management at the time, by the CEO of the pharma division, to be very proactive and to put in place a process, a system that allows to be compliant. And uh, uh, that's also why we had chosen to have a dedicated group who just is responsible for disclosure. And also we were very early on in uh, building a, a repository, at the time it was with Center Watch, uh, to allow to have this an independent uh, repository of registration data. Back in 2005, clinicaltrials.gov was only for US trials, so European trials or non-US trials couldn't be used that. And also nobody was talking about the results. And uh, industry uh, was the first uh, organization who actually said, uh, also through IFPMA, uh, registry is nice, it's one thing, we are going to do it, and the joint uh, position paper is a reflection of this, but we also need to, uh, to address the, uh, the results piece. And at that time, nobody was talking about results. City.gov had no possibility to, uh, to capture results or to share results. And that's why we wanted to be proactive, because we realized this is something that is not going away. Uh, patients uh, were asking for the results, and it's the right thing to be done. Uh, what we posted at the time, and it's still done today, to my knowledge, is the, uh, the summary in a, in a structured way. Also, we selected the so-called ICH summary that goes into the, final, in the clinical study report because it's uh, a regulatory format. It's reviewed. There is a third-party review by medical writers, so it has also some quality. So it's not something that it's, it's too much. Or it can be influenced at all by marketing. Mm -hmm. Now, Nicola had brought up a point, Bert's brought up a point where we're putting in these systems. Now, I want to take this back to the EU level. You know, you need to fund this stuff, and if you're dealing with universities that are in partnership, you need to have compliance systems, IT. I mean, John, he drives a nice car. IBM's not cheap. 
how do you pay for this stuff? So we're looking in the context of Horizon 2020, one of the things that keeps coming up is the use of structural funds. Now there's been increasing nice warm fuzzy noises coming out of the commission that there's a, increasingly a willingness to look at the utilization of structural funds to build these sort of infrastructures we're discussing today. Is this the policy right now going forward that there's an, potentially a, a window opening to supply funding under structural funds for this? Well, structural funds are a known pot of money mm -hmm. not related to Horizon 2020. Uh, okay. And it's mainly um, governed by DG Regio in connection with the member states. So, But you file papers in support or not of certain well, positions. Well, we push, uh, we try to convince DG Regio to open the possibility for funding allocated to health issues. Mm -hmm. And in the, the new uh, document, the priorities for 2014-2020 of the structural funds for the European region, Regional Fund, uh, they mention explicitly ICT for societal challenges, including e-health. So the framework is there. But it's up to then the national authorities to decide, or the regions, more or less, the, le the regions to decide which of the priorities they, are got, are, they will put in the focus. So the framework is there. The money can be spent for building the infrastructure needed for e-health services. But it is, in the end, the decision of the authorities in the region. Mm -hmm. And John, would you think, do you think that's a good solution? <laughs> well, uh, Loaded question of the day. So, so we, we, we recognize that you know, health and social care systems around Europe are, are all under tremendous strain at the moment. And there's certainly, we've been on a journey, this e-health journey for quite a long time. I mean, e-health itself is not a new concept. Uh, uh, what we're hoping is that the, the current you know, financial crisis will get people to start thinking about sustainability of their health and social care systems and the role of technology in supporting that. So. You know, we'd be very much in favor of, 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 um, of uh, suggesting that um, one of the most effective investments you can make in today's world in Europe is to invest in projects and that, that not only um, create a more sustainable care system because you make it more efficient, but also generate new industries within the regions uh, that are making these investments. So the idea of, uh, of economic activity being stimulated by investment in e-health and e-health projects We'd see some of the stuff that's happening now with big data as kind of, is, is kind of the next turn of the screw on e-health. E-health has been so far about joining up uh, healthcare um, settings using informatics, and now we need to start thinking about how do we use that to collaborate with each other, to share data, and to generate insights. So I think that's where we're moving to next. And, and Nicola, uh, 30 years ago, Wellcome was primarily UK-based on most of their research activities. How has that evolved now in the last... 10, 20 years, how, not that you've been there in 10, 20 years, but how uh, do you see this change? Our international spend is increasing. It's now up to about 15%, but it wouldn't be right to say that we were solely UK mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Following sort of Henry Welcome, our founder's lead, we often had an interest in tropical medicine, but it is now 15% international spend. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that is focused on lower middle income countries. So we have major overseas programs in Africa and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Would you see the use of some of the EU more targeted and structural funds going in some of Eastern Europe, the Ascension countries, for example, would that be, do you see that as a good thing, bad thing, something that could be beneficial? <coughs> well, I think a lot of the trials that we're talking about are global, so I think it's important to recognize that in any funding systems. Okay. Any questions from the audience? I've got a few more questions. Does anyone have anything they'd like to bring up to the panel? Yes, right there. Please say your name and your organization, please. Hello, uh, Achine Scalis. I'm the executive director of the Medicines Evaluation Board in the Netherlands. And together with Hans Georg, uh, he's the more scientific regulator. I have <coughs> uh, some other issues uh, at my mind. Uh, and that's day-to-day -day issues when people come to the uh, MEB in the Netherlands on, uh, and do uh, reflect on the Freedom of Information Act, uh, things like that. So just on operational things. And I've been involved in this discussion now for uh, almost a decade. Uh, and I see that we are moving a little bit forward uh, at the moment. But still, I think uh, I see also a lot of blur and fog. And again, here uh, in this meeting, 
I hear a lot of words and I, I, I can see that they're all kind of initiatives, etc. But I'm just on a very operational issue. I have to, uh, to uh, compel with the Freedom of Information Act uh, uh, things. And I, as a regulator and as a, a representative of the public, uh, certainly in the Netherlands, but I'm also a, um, uh, a member of the uh, uh, management board of the EMA, representing the Netherlands there. Uh, and I can see it also in the EMA. Uh, there is also an operational thing uh, that costs us a lot of resources uh, to Your comply question, with those things. Yes. Well, uh, I would like to, uh, to come out of this afternoon, and maybe I'm a little bit too early now, uh, and maybe you can address it in the next panel or now, but I would come to have uh, uh, a very uh, 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 nice uh, issues to see a, a time frame of one or two years in which, for example, we uh, change the ECTD, uh, the data that we get as a regulator from the industry, so that with one push of the button, I get out commercial confidential information and uh, uh, public uh, 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 patient confidential information, etc. And then as somebody said it, um, I, I don't think it is the cloud, but uh, anyway, on the, on, the, on the net, I can just, after we have taken a decision and granted a marketing authorization for a product, I can just put it on my uh, net and I can keep on uh, uh, using my resources on the scientific work that we do, on the assessment work that we do, and not on administrative burdens uh, in which I, uh, I, I need my people to do other things. Okay. Thank you. Nicola, if someone comes to you with a request for data, how long is the process right now? Uh, to Sanger? Yes. It varies on what the request is. Average? Midpoint? Guess? I think that some, some requests would go through in five days, some mm -hmm. would go through within three months. Okay. Don't hold me to any of those. You, need, you want it push of a button faster, so we're not there yet. Okay. So, uh, if I, uh, I, I have uh, a, a request and then I have to put out uh, to the requester, might it be the industry or an advocate or a journalist, which yeah. I have now two requests from journalists already with. And then they ask for tens of thousands of pages. Yeah. Right? So if we still look at the old uh, thing, data, tens of thousands of pages, which have to be reviewed. And there I have to pull out the uh, commercial confidential information and the patient uh, confidential information. So what? I just need to have an electronic uh, thing. And I, there's a lot of companies here. And I would dare to uh, tell your ICH people, for example, to work uh, on a world standard. And it should be, it's just, in my opinion, it's just an IT problem. Uh, we have electronic data and then we pull it out and we publish everything else. Thank you. You want to make a comment, Bart? Uh, there, is a, there is a technology solution that, for instance, ha has been employed in the automotive industry for the past 20 years. It's structured content authoring, st structured content management. That would allow you to do that prospectively, not retrospectively. And this is exactly what uh, is happening. For instance, when they build manuals, maintenance books like this, uh, they put the information in such a way that then the document, now we still think in terms of document, becomes a rendition of what has been captured uh, previously. And there, literally, at the, at the push of a button, you can generate different versions. This is something that would, again, I think would require a dialogue between industry, within the industry, to come up with a, with a common platform. The technology exists. It's around, has been around for 20 years. But, uh, you know, that dialogue has been, uh, been there already for years. Yeah. And I want to have a solution within the next year or something. Thank you. We get your point, and we'll move on. <laughs> but yes, we understand. I think part of the problem is there's no standard right now. I think we're trying to search for standards. Welcome is offered a standard. I mean, Nicholas said we could do a standard. Now, three months might not be enough because right now the system requires three months because there aren't standards in place. But I think there could be a standard in place if industry agrees. Now you're in a situation where Europe could agree and the U.S. wouldn't, which is a problem. So we need to join those two. Now, um, again, I like to end on time and under budget, and we've got just three minutes here. So I just want to ask everyone for one final comment. 
Giselle, what do you think is the biggest challenge for utilizing data as we've discussed today? And how do you see Europe trying to move forward with that and solve that problem? Well, I see the biggest challenge in, well, with respect to the work of the Commission, always to find the right balance. So on the one hand, we have to to enable industry to grow, to create jobs, etc. We have to support research that they can do uh, their work the better, uh, like the best they can. And we have to take care of the, the privacy and uh, the interest of the citizen. So there's always this balancing, do we need regulation? Yes, regulation protects the citizen, but will <coughs> hamper then the, the free um, use of, of, uh, of systems. So there is always um, a, lot, a, well, a lot of work before we come to final conclusions, because we really have to, to weight the individual interest, to take all of them in, into account. John, IBM. How do you see IBM able to deal with this issue of data from clinical trials? And how do you see IBM playing a role going forward? Well, I'd say that we don't see this as a, tech, a technical issue at all. It's not a technology limitation here. It, it, I think the limitations are more with uh, policy, with regulation, and also with, uh, with securing the public's trust. I mean, if we're going to start publishing data in this way, it's all very well to say we can anonymize it. But actually, experts will tell you, you, you really can't guarantee that. There are always ways of linking back to the individual. So somehow we've got to get the public on our side in terms of trust, trusting the industry to do the right things with the data. And from a technical point of view, I guess we're looking at um, you know, where do we target what we can now do with technology in society to get the best results? Um, because there's many, many different ways of uh, approaching this, and I think we need to work very closely with uh, academia, with uh, policy makers, and understand where do you want to put this technology to get the right results for your health and care systems, whether that's clinical research, whether that's uh, healthcare uh, delivery, or whether it's just the way you organize the system uh, and, have, and basically set up the feedback with your citizens. Bert, how do you see the toolkit and going forward. Is that the final solution that you can institute? <laughs> is that the, everything, the, the chalice, or is there something else? No, that would be ridiculous. I mean, this is a very, very small contribution. It's okay. a very little uh, brick <laughs> in the wall that we need to break. <laughs> okay. And Nicola, what do you, well, how do you think Welcome is going to play in this? Do you want to play in this? And how do you see it going forward is, and with the data protection issues and patient data in particular? Uh, we would like to be involved in in exploring whether there is interest in the idea of a joined up model um, and in helping to transition to that if there is support for it. I think it's a very long journey. We're not going to get there overnight. I think the way the debate is moving is extremely helpful, but we need to make sure that it's joined up along the way as it goes forward. Great. I think it's been very interesting. Everyone, please welcome the panel and say thank you. It was excellent.